Welcome to the Restoring Our City podcast. My name is Jobin. This is our platform where we have candid conversations on today's topics to help connect our community. And we've got a really great one uh, in this episode. We are connecting with the former pastor of Willow Creek South Lake, uh, Gina Cherian, who's been an impressive member and leader of our community. And she, she shares a lot of great wisdom and insight into leading and even leading through challenging circumstances. And so you do not want to miss this episode. And joined with me on this episode is Josh Gravilla, our fellow collaborator. He actually attends Willow Creek South Lake campus. And uh, it's great to connect with him again, and then also have this great wise conversation with Gina. So I hope you learn a lot of great practical leadership lessons from this episode. And as always, if you haven't already subscribe to our podcast, you can find the Restoring Our City podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can also watch the video versions of the episode on YouTube as well. Follow us, engage with us on our social media channels. You can find all of that info on our website at restoringourcity.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome, everyone, to the Restoring Our City podcast. We're super excited to bring you another episode, and we have been highlighting leaders in our community, and we're super excited to bring another great leader from our community, Gina Cherry. And before we bring her on, I want to introduce my fellow co-host today, Josh Curavilla, who's on with us. Josh, how are you doing, man? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm, I, I got... A personal connection with Gina, so I'm excited to have her on today. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Gina it is was the former lead pastor of the South Lake Willow Creek campus, and she is on with us. And I know Josh, you were uh, you're a member of that church too. It, it's so great to have that connection. And so Gina, we are so excited to have you on the podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you guys. Yeah, thanks for being on. And we are so excited to, to just gain some insight and in your leadership style and, and just get some wisdom from you um, on how to lead and, and, and challenges through leadership. So can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from and, and kind of your background? Sure, I'll tell you that. But just to, to set the record straight, you're going to learn from all the mistakes I've made. So, you know, it'll be great. I will have made them before you and then everybody Perfect. else can learn from them. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, a little bit about me. Um, so I am kind of born, brought up in Chicago. So Chicago runs through my blood. You know, my family is all here. And uh, we grew up in the Indian church and the Martha church and our family is really, really involved there. And, and from a young age, I was, you know, just in church all the time. And so, you know, I, I did a lot of leading in the Martha church and things like that, but um, you know, as you guys know, women don't really serve in ministry roles in, in most Indian churches. And so uh, that whole idea of serving in a church as a pastor, like wasn't even on my radar. And so that kind of came later, but um, you know, I came to faith, uh, in it was basically eighth grade I went to a conference and uh, there was that was the first time that I really heard about having a personal relationship with Jesus for myself right and not my, letting my faith be my parents faith but making it my own faith and so that was kind of the first time I heard about that and so that's kind of when I feel like I I say that like that's when I figured out okay this is how I get into heaven but it took a little while for like heaven to get into me and like really affect the way that I lived and so that took many years and still is a work in progress but uh, there was a another kind conference actually when I was a freshman in college called Urbana. It's a big missions conference. And that was probably, yeah, you guys might be familiar with it. That was probably the first time I remember saying, okay, God, however you want to use my life, I'm open, you know, hands wide open and I'll say yes to whatever you call me to. But it was several years before that actually led to, to full-time ministry. And so that's probably a little bit about faith side of uh, family. I've been married this year, it'll be 20 years, which is crazy. Wow. <laughs> know, right? Thanks. I did get married right out of college, like a year out of college. But, uh, we married for 20 years. My husband, I will tell you this, I uh, fell in love with him when, because he led worship and, you know, he has the best voice voice of anybody I know. So that's, uh, he, that's, that's my husband, Sajeev. And we have two kids. Uh, my son's in high school. He is uh, really witty and smart and he's a super loud talker. So that's, that's my son. And uh, my daughter uh, is in third grade and she's super sweet and fun and joyful. And so that's a little bit about our family. That's awesome. And Man, 20 years. I've been married uh, six years. And I feel like we've just started the, the marathon. Um, yes. That's that's awesome to hear. And so 
uh, I love hearing that you're from Chicago and it runs through your blood. I feel like a lot of the guys on this podcast uh, feel the same way. And that's awesome to see you having an impact in your community, uh, especially through the church and um, with ministry too. I know you mentioned Urbana. I, I know a lot of folks who have gone to Urbana and just had their life changed. Tell us a little bit about like the calling for ministry. Was it clear cut or did you ever wrestle with that at all? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I would say that I always loved serving the church because, I, you know, even as the way I watched my parents live their lives, specifically my dad, you know, work was just work, but what gave his life meaning was how he served at church. And so several nights a week, all weekend long, like he was really, I mean, he gave his life to the church. And so that's the, the model I grew up with. And um, that's kind of where I saw meaning as well. I just kind of saw work as like, hey, that's how you earn a living, you know, and just get the necessities of life. But if you're going to have a real impact, it's going to be serving in the church. And um, we were part of the Indian church for a long time and then, and, and served a ton in like our, our youth group and things. And then after uh, we were married, I was teaching in the city. I was actually a high school teacher in the city. And I wanted a place that I could invite like my coworkers and my students and you know, it's just, they weren't going to come to an Indian church. And so we started to look for a church where um, it was, you know, multi-ethnic, where we, we could invite our friends and actually really share our faith. And so it was still kind of, you know, ministry was, was this side gig in a way, but it was also the thing that gave my life a ton of meaning. And so, um, you know, that's what, that's what we did. And then, you know, fast forward life happens and, you know, there's career and kids and like, you know, everything else kind of takes a back seat. And um, it was in 2015, I actually, uh, had moved into a career in administration in schools. And um, I knew at the end of the school year that th where I was at, like I was going to leave and, and just look to see what God had next. And I wasn't sure if I was going to, I was in, in administration. I thought I'd go back maybe to teaching, but at that same time I had, was actually serving um, pretty regularly at our church. And I always served in children's ministry. I loved it. Um, but I was just like looking to see what, what God would do. And, and in, during that summer, I had a conversation with a person who was on staff at the church and they said, have you ever considered a career in ministry? And it was like, my like soul felt like it was on fire. Like I almost oh, wow. knew in that moment, like, oh, this is what God wants me to do next. And I was actually, um, Willow Creek, the church that you know, I was at, was puts on a big global leadership summit every year. And yep. uh, the, our church leaders at that time had some extra tickets and they invited me to come. And it was during that summit that they asked me, hey, you know, is this something you'd be willing to pray about? And I just, I mean, I, I have the text that I like texted my husband, like, I can't believe this is happening. And I think this is where, where God is calling. And, um, and for me, it's always, you know, usually there's something I sense, you know, in my spirit, and then it's usually confirmed by scripture and then by people close to me. And so, you know, I shared with a couple of my really good girlfriends and asked them to pray and just kind of said, Hey, you know, do you sense that this is what God might have for me? Do you have concerns? And, um, yeah, so I actually started a, in children's ministry, and then over the last five or six years, there were just a couple different opportunities where, you know, they asked me to step into some different roles, and again, that commitment that I had to God back in Urbana was, I will open my hands to you, God, and I'll say yes to whatever you ask, but especially in ministry, like, I don't look at it as like a career, right? So it's not like you're climbing the ladder like you might do in any, you know, corporate role, and right it's just, it's weird. It's different like that, you know? And so I, um, but I did say, Hey God, if you provide the opportunity, I'll say yes. And just one by one, God did that. And so in each time I felt confirmation and leading from God and, um, prayer and scripture and just in the people around me and, and excitement kind of in my soul too. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and Gina, I mean, I think I had the privilege i didn't realize it at the time when i started going to willow south lake i just went because my parents were going uh and it's a good way to connect with them each week but kind of got to see you move through all those roles and i know my mom um has been you know has had a uh, strong relationship with yes. you throughout that entire period of time and i think a lot of people at the church and, and you know that from you know even the sunday you were leaving kind of look up to you and, and look to you as a leader uh, as a pastor but also um you know just as a mentor right and i'm a big believer in mentorship right Right. I think it defines who we are as the people around us. So, you know, maybe who's been like a big, you know, influence in your kind of leadership style or even just been a big mentor in your life? That's a great question. Well, you mentioned your mom and it's uh, I remember the first time I had coffee with Susie and it's like 
you know, she's become one of my like closest friends. And I think for me, honestly, as a, you know, kind of younger Indian woman looking in, to like lead in these spaces, it was so powerful to watch her in her leadership role and to kind of see myself in her and to say, okay, she can do this in the space that she's in. Maybe I can do that too. And I just remember thinking like, it's so powerful to see uh, people that look like you leading in different spaces because it opens up this world of possibility. And, and uh, Josh, your mom was that for me in, in so many ways. And so she would, she'd be one of those people I'd consider uh, as a mentor and somebody who really not just mentored me, but just came alongside and was a relentless encourager of me. And so um, she's, she's definitely uh, someone I put on that list. Um, my dad is that way as well. You know, you usually think of uh, Malayali dads, Indian dads being kind of stoic and maybe distant, but my dad really, like, I, what I say is I can imagine a loving heavenly father because of the way my dad was with my sister and I, you know, he was always proud of us, always, you know, pushed us to try things. He was, he's just, he is just to this day, you know, my biggest encourager. And even when like I was pursuing things like ministry, like, you know, it's such a, like when people ask my parents what I do, like, I know it's a hard question. It's a little bit awkward for them to answer. <laughs> and uh, my dad is so proud and he's, he tells them proudly. And um, I think that has just, that has given me like a confidence and a, um, I, I just, that he's influenced me in just some really tremendous ways. And so um, just him being proud of me and unashamedly, you know, proud. And so my dad, for sure, um, at our church at Willow, at our campus, uh, the, the lead pastor before me was a guy by the name of Matt Wright. And Matt is a leader and a mentor for me because he opened doors for me that I would have never thought to like like even turn the handle of the doorknob, you know, I mean, he was the one that kind of called me out and said, Hey, I see this in you. I want you to, you know, I want you to preach a message. And I was like, me, you know, I, I'm not like, I, I don't, I can't preach a message. And, and he didn't just like invite me to do those things, but he actually walked alongside me and taught me, you know, and, and when I had questions and, you know, needed advice and counsel, he was available to me. But uh, what I, the powerful thing for, for me with him was that he saw things for me that I couldn't see for myself and he made those things happen for me. So I'm really grateful to him. Yeah. That's, that's like, you know, those mentorship experiences are so impactful and, you know, maybe going back to a point you talked about, um, you know, it's, it's very empowering to see people like you in leadership. Right. And I think it's more, even more that way when you're underrepresented because it just, it, it feels so special. Like to see you as an Indian woman, you know, bleeding our church, like that meant a lot to me. Right. And I know it meant a lot to my mom and um, other people in our church. Um, and, you know, there's that kind of underrepresentation, especially in the Indian community with, you know, female leaders, especially in ministry. Right. And part of it is the cultural aspect. Um, some people just don't believe that women have a place in ministry, which, you know, is not our belief at all. And, and we, I, I think there's a lot of value in diversity of thought and, and look and gender and all of those different things. Um, you know, how, how did, you know, did you face any challenges being a, you know, female leader or a minority leader being somebody of South Asian descent in, in your leadership roles? You know, it was, as a, at Willow, Willow has actually for 40 plus years really pushed this value of women in leadership. And, you know, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it, but when I first got there, I was kind of like, okay, that's great. But I hadn't even really resolved the theology for myself of, um, well, you know, we know Paul has some words, you know, about uh, women in the church and how they're to serve. And so it actually took me some time to kind of say, hey, I could actually be convicted of this in my spirit too. And so uh, there was probably in me more to resolve just because of the, the places I had been and served um, prior to, to being at Willow. Um, but a couple things about what you said, you know, that we read about in the gospels, the gospel is for the Gentile and the Jew, you know, the male, female, slave and free. And I would joke like, you know, if you look at the leadership circles of most uh, big mega churches, it looks like the gospel came for the Caucasian male, you know, and, and if we're really going to be um, in a church that's supposed to reflect um, what we're going to experience in heaven someday. And if we're really going to be bring God's kingdom here on earth, then we've got to have all of the experiences. We've got to have the diversity of the entire kingdom represented because otherwise 
it's not that we're just, oh, missing out on like, hey, people are different and it's nice to have different people, but we're missing out on the aspects of like God's goodness and his character when we don't have the, the full representation around the table. And so uh, one of the things that Willow did was, it, it, again, they really um, empowered me, gave me tons of opportunity. And I saw that happen for women. Uh, but, you know, so I sat on the executive team. I was the only, uh, my, you know, person of color on the executive team until more recently. And I did remember there were several times. And again, I, you know, I went to the senior pastor, my first one-on-one -on -one, and I said, and I had just become the lead pastor. And I said, listen, I need to know right now that you didn't just hire me because I'm an Indian woman and I check a box for you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, it was just my honest question. Like, I don't want to be a checkbox. Like, I want to know that you believe that I'm, you know, capable and that God has called me to this role. And, and he was, you know, totally assured me he's one of my mentors and, you know, uh, he's a great guy. Uh, but, you know, there were times that I felt the weight of representing people of color and their voices at this leadership table. And uh, it, it was, I, have, I had great colleagues and people who really understood some of the racial tensions that we're facing. But even still, you know, I felt that pressure of like, I, I know that there are people that are glad that I'm in this seat and in this position because they feel represented. And so I feel the way to, I want to represent them well. I want to represent their issues well. I want to speak up when I should. I want to be discerning when I should. But I, um, I would say that that was always encouraged, but I, I also felt the weight of that. And I felt like, and I read this later that basically around leadership circles until it's more like, you know, 30% or more of the table is diverse. It's really difficult to have genuine multi-ethnic leadership. And so, um, but, you know, it was also, it was a really great experience and, you know, I was, I was thankful for it, but definitely there were, there were some challenges. Yeah, I think that there's always that feeling of if you're the underrepresented one representing everyone else, you got to have an answer for, you know, in your case, maybe all women or all Indian people. And it's like, it's like, bro, I don't know all this. Like, I have, like I've, I've been in work situations where somebody turns to me when there's like some India in the news or something. Like, what do you think about that? And I'm like, oh, I'm American. I was born here. I don't know. Like, maybe ask my dad. I'll give you his number. But <laughs> Yeah, we carry the weight of you know, our country, our ethnicity, our background on our shoulders. That's that's so interesting. I feel like you just dropped the mic there, Gina. I think that's so powerful and encouraging for folks to hear as well, right? Like to see people in leadership and then understand that there are challenges there. It's not just the the X's and O's, so to speak. It's really, um, you know, just the, the congregation and there's people's lives, especially in a role in ministry. And that really triggered triggered a question in my head where, like challenges, not only being a female Indian leader in ministry, but like just being in leadership in a challenging circumstance, right? Um, like with Willow Creek, I, I don't know if a lot of people know, or maybe our listeners who are not in the Chicagoland area. I mean, Willow Creek was at one time, one of the biggest, if not the biggest church in America, right? Yeah. Um, and it's produced so many great leaders. And I know they had um, challenges that were very public over the past couple of years. And so maybe the environment itself was challenging. So can you speak a little bit about leading and taking these roles in a challenging environment? Yeah, that's a great question. It was what I felt like was my entire time of leading was through challenge. And in some ways, the, the challenges created opportunity because I first stepped into my role when they, they tapped on our lead pastor's shoulder to be the executive pastor over the whole church. And so really, it's in a time of crisis for the church, the entire elder board and the two lead pastors had kind of stepped down following the, the scandal and crisis uh, surrounding Bill Hybels. And so that, you know, happened kind of over a couple of days in August. And literally, you know, a few days later, uh, Matt, who was our lead pastor, said, hey, Gina, you know, if, I, if they ask me to be the exec pastor, which I think might happen, I'm going to ask you to step in as the lead pastor. And, you know, it was it was one of those things that I think because um, I still haven't resolved in my head how to have proper ambition in ministry. You know, I think sometimes people told me you can have godly ambition, right? Godly ambition is good, not selfish ambition. But for me, I'm like, it's hard for me to discern that in my soul. So like, I'm probably not going to be someone I haven't figured out yet how to go and like seek out a position. But 
if I'm approached, I'll say yes, you know? And so, and that's what happened. So the crisis created that opportunity. And then it was leading in a, a really tumultuous time where people had so many questions, uh, really lost trust. And I think the two things that, um, you know, I look back and I think that God, uh, you know, brings the right leaders for the right seasons. And when I look back, I'm a really relational person. And so I think that that actually helped because I had relationships with people in the church. And the other thing is, I felt like I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm going to tell you if I struggle with something, I'm going to tell you, hey, yeah, that's a struggle for me too. And uh, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to tell you honestly, what's going on as best as I know it and and can share. And so um, I think I, I tried to really regain the trust of people through relationship. And um, and because they knew me, I had been around the church, you know, since basically the beginning that helped, I came, you know, I think that really uh, just helped lead our church through that time. Um, but the other thing, and you know, it's when you're leading in crisis like that, you know, that you by yourself are not capable of leading through it. And I never had prayed prayers where I was like fully laid out on the ground, face to the ground until the last few years. And, and I knew like, there is no way that I have any sort of wisdom or ability to lead through a season like this, unless I am fully surrendered and dependent on God to lead. And I um, had times with God, like I'd never had before. I would spend my, I had our Sabbath was on Fridays and I would spend hours like praying and walking and just like confessing, like, God, I have no idea how to lead in this. This is my first time in this kind of role. Like I literally, before this crisis had preached my very first sermon on a Sunday. So like, then, you know, like two weeks later, it's like, okay, now you're stepping into this role. And, you know, and I, uh, I just felt like I, I have nowhere to go, but God. And so, and, you know, you guys know, sometimes that's the best place to be um, because then, you know, God can show up and do his thing. And so I can look at all the leadership and the ways, you know, and the things that God had uh, kind of gifted me with, but really God had to show up and, and he did, you know, and re- he really, I think, led us, our church and our congregation through that. Yeah. God loves to take something that you think is your strength and break it down and, you know, teach you from that place because it shows his power, right? Yeah. It shows his strength. But I, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about different challenges and, you know, all different things you've done. Um, how do you continue to grow? You know, how do you challenge yourself to continue to grow um, in leadership and in what you're doing? Um, and then maybe on the practical side, um, you know, what are some resources or different things that you use um, to, you know, learn more about leadership or again, continue to grow? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think the best ways to grow in leadership is actually to, to have opportunities and do it, you know, but outside of that, um, I, you know, I listen to podcasts and so, you know, which is great because, you know, I have one more to add to my list. And um, one of the ones that I listen to, and this is particularly as a church leader, is this uh, podcast called the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. And it's, it's geared, you know, towards leaders, but I would say primarily church leaders. And um, he just talks to different people in all walks of life. And, and I don't always agree with every Thing I hear, but you get to hear so many different perspectives. So that's one. I am a pretty avid reader, so I read a ton. You know, I don't know that I've read all the books on the shelf behind me, but I, I do read a lot. And so um, there's several books that have really influenced my leadership. And um, one of the things that was interesting to me, so growing up in an Indian church, I always felt like there's sometimes this um, um, dichotomy between people who knew a lot about the Bible, but their lives didn't really reflect it, you know, or like mm-hmm. you knew that home life was messed up, but they could come to church and speak <laughs> really, really well, you know, and I didn't have words or language for that uh, until I, I got to Willow and we started, we went through a couple of books, but one um, was this book called, by Pete Scazzaro called The Emotionally Healthy Church. And he's got a whole series of books, Emotionally Healthy Leader, you know, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Uh, But he really went through five different areas of our lives. It's things like, you know, embracing our limits, you know, breaking the power of the past, you know, living, you know, vulnerably. And and we kind of went through each of these areas as as a leadership team. And it 
it actually was like, oh, this is why some people were very spiritually, like they had a lot of spiritual knowledge, but very emotionally unhealthy. And so you could see this disintegration of their lives because their home life and their church life, you know, were two different things. And so, um, you know, I think reading has honestly helped me quite a bit. Uh, there's a, a book right now that just recently came out uh, by a guy named Rich Viotas, and it's called The Deeply Formed Life. And he, um, he kind of expands on some of these concepts that I talked about, but also adds things like, you know, racial justice. Uh, he talks about sexual ethic, you know, so he just talks about what it looks like as leaders to actually live a life on the inside and behind the scenes um, that outpaces whatever role we have. And so um, those are things that have helped me. And again, there's, you know, there's a few authors where I'll read anything by like Patrick Lencioni and John Maxwell and Andy Stanley, like these guys all have fantastic books on, on leadership. So those are some of the things that, that have helped me a ton. And, you know, to be honest, one of the things that's helped me is I um, three years ago started seeing a counselor because I was like, I knew I was going to take on all of these leadership challenges and I wanted a safe space to kind of process all of that. And I have fantastic friends, but I'm like, I don't know if they want to, you know, always hear all my church stuff and what I'm wrestling with. And um, she, my counselor has been a uh, part of my life. That's really just helped me um, be, you know, just emotionally and spiritually healthy. So that's been another one. Yeah. I think that's an interesting um, topic of just, you know, seeing a counselor, I think, you know, again, you think about the Indian community, but just in general, I think the it's kind of almost seen as weakness or you can feel that you're weak if you're talking to somebody about your problems or it's like, oh, why wouldn't you just talk to your friend or why wouldn't you just do that? Um, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit more on like what you think the, the power of, you know, seeing a counselor is and, you know, how we can be, um, how we can empower that kind of culture of, hey, that's okay. Because I think mental health now more than ever being in this remote environment, I, I've experienced it myself, right? Just like I would say most people, some level of, uh, you know, mental health uh, and emotional issues, just being remote and not being able to connect and not being able to come to Willow South Lake and give somebody a hug and all those different things. But, you know, how do we normalize um, that counseling culture because i think it is very biblical right to seek out wise counsel and to talk through issues but it seems to be something that's not normal in our community how, how do you think we could you know work to normalize that i think partially it's doing what you're doing just talking about it you know and making it not a stigma and so it's something i bring up often in conversations because you know, not because i just want to normalize it but because it truly has helped me I think in my spiritual growth, I think I've grown more over the last five years, um, kind of spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and just been much healthier as a person um, because it is several things, but my counselor has been a part of that journey. And, uh, you know, we know we're never done growing, you know, until we, we get to heaven, right? God is always working on us. But if we can be the best representations of Christ that we can be, then we're going to serve our families better. We're going to serve our communities and our coworkers and our, you know, neighborhoods better. And so um, I feel like, you know, we all have things in our past. And like, you know, if you look at my family's story and if you like, there's nothing that you'd be like, oh, that's really like traumatic. I, but uh, seeing a counselor has helped me unpack like, oh, why do I respond the ways that I do? Or why am I defensive in these situations? Or, hey, when I said or did that, was that was that the right way to respond to that? And, you know, for me, it was uncovering some things like people pleasing, you know, I have a people pleasing tendency. And um, part of that too, is I don't like confrontation, right? But I saw so I would avoid things that really did need to be confronted. And so she would kind of walk me through like, okay, let's role play this conversation. Like, what are you going to say? And especially like, to my, you know, authority, you know, I always felt like submit to authority. And, and there were things that like I had to bring up and, and she helped me work through like the language and the just even having the courage to have those conversations. And so um, I think honestly, it's by talking about it that normalizes it. And, um, and it's like, you know, it's kind of like going to see a, a coach if you're trying to work out and get healthy, like nobody thinks it's like a shameful thing to like, hey, oh, yeah, you're gonna go get a personal trainer. Like, no, that's, not, that's great. Like, it means you're taking your health seriously. And I think it's the same thing with a counselor and your emotional, you know, and, and relational health. You know, the spotlight on mental health is, is there, especially with the, with this pandemic going on. I think it's brought it to the forefront. Um, Gina, I think you brought some great advice and, and just even great lessons for us to just develop as leaders you know, from what you just shared. But 
if there's something that you would share to women in general who want to aspire to get into leadership or striving for those those positions or roles or just encouragement, what would you share? Yeah, you know, one of the the stats I heard, and I didn't know this until recently, but it's if there's a like a, a job opening, men will typically apply if they meet 60% of the qualifications, but women won't apply unless they meet 100% of the qualifications. And so I think what I'd say to women out there is, hey, if there are things and roles that look interesting to you, go ahead and put your name in the ring. You know, like you have nothing to lose by doing that. And if you need somebody to encourage you, like call me, I'll encourage you to do it. You know, but it's it's really we're, just- We're going to put your number on the screen right <laughs> now. And... Um, but really it's just to, to go out there and really try and, and put your name out there and go after it. And I thought that was really interesting because I'm like, I just, I'd never really realized that. The other thing I think women can sometimes struggle with, which is, it's been a personal struggle for me is the idea of like imposter syndrome. And it's not just women, you know, men struggle with this too, but this idea of like, oh gosh, you know, if they really knew like how little I knew, I don't know if they would, you know, pick me to do this. And um, what has really helped is, is my faith is to say, okay, God, you know, if, if you call me to this, I'm going to trust that you're going to equip me to do the work. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my part to be faithful and to walk in humility and obedience and surrender, but, and be faithful, but I'm going to trust that God is going to show up and, and equip me to do the work that he's called me to. And so I just encourage women, like, go ahead, you know, get, get out there and just try it. Like, don't be, uh, don't hold back. Cause you know, I really think we have one life to live and then it's over. And so, you know, let's take the risks that we can, you know, while we can. And so that's what I'd say. And then honestly, to men and women, I'd say, you know, one of the things I heard recently was um, if you really want to be a great witness for your faith, do a really good job at work because like nobody wants to hear about faith from somebody who's kind of like slacking off and <laughs> mediocre. <laughs> it's like your, your credibility really, you know, lessons. But um, one of the things I'd say is if you're going to at your, at your job, like do what you say you're going to do. When somebody asks you to do something like do it with so much care and um, you know, like do a really, really good job. And like, if you don't know how to do something, get help. But um you know, I really believe in the, the scripture that talks about we work as if we're working under the Lord, not for ourselves, no matter what we're called to do, right? And whether it's you're sitting at a computer, you know, you're consulting, whatever you're doing, our job is to be faithful to God in that. And so that's what I would say to both women and men too. Yeah, I totally believe that. And we should do things in a spirit of excellence. And yeah. um, that's just definitely a great example. And so Gina, um, what's next for you? Is there anything that we can kind of look forward to or how can our community get behind you and support you? Oh, that's great. Well, so I guess one of the things that's next for me is, um, you know, I'm still, I, I feel very called to ministry. And so I left Willow a little over a month ago, uh, but I still very feel very called to ministry. But I had said, hey, God, like, you're going to have to open the doors, you know, because again, like, I'm not, I have no idea, you know, it's one ministry opportunities for women and especially women of color can be limited, right? And, and our family's not moving. Uh, but um, there's something called Home Church, which is, it's like on Zoom. And uh, the pastor there was all, used to be a pastor at Willow and asked me to kind of teach a couple of times. And so I'm going to do that. And we're just going to explore and see what that looks like. Uh, one of the other areas that I'm really passionate about, which probably came out a little bit as we were talking, is the idea of the multi-ethnic church, because I really believe in the picture that we see in Revelation. I want that, that to be part of our reality now. And so I've been praying and asking uh, God, like, God, how can I kind of help move that vision forward. And that's, you know, God's vision for the church and it's, you know, a true picture of the gospel. And so I, um, I want to be a part of that kind of a church, but I also want to think beyond that. And so I'm kind of just having conversations, exploring like what it would look like to, um, yeah, take that vision more broadly. So that if prayers around that and what that could look like, uh, would totally be appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Definitely something that we will be praying and, and rooting you on, um, and we'll, we'll be keeping an eye as well. And if there's anything we can do as a community to help encourage and support you, we're all for it. Uh, Gina, thank you so much for being on. This has been a treat. Uh, we'd love to have you back on sometime and, and just kind of see how you're doing, but we appreciate you jumping on. Thanks so much. It was really good. Great to be with you guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode. We hope you learned a lot of great practical leadership lessons from Gina Cherian and how to lead well 
through challenging circumstances. And so as always, we love to hear from you. Please engage with us on our social media channels. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can find all that information on our website at restoringourcity.org. And don't forget to subscribe. You can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the video versions are on YouTube as well. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>